Join us on our website at www.thegrandview.org and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting. Now, for those of you who had the excuse that the hardware store didn't have plants this, this week, or that you didn't get to the hardware store, that didn't mean that you can just get out of the exercise. Just because you can't get your hands on something doesn't mean you get scot-free. If you can't get plants at the hardware store because it's winter time, then what you do is you pull them out of your yard. And if you can't get them out of your yard, then you go to your neighbor's yard at night. <laughs> Why do I give you, why do I give you these homework assignments? It's so that you practice. And right now we're dealing with practicing every week as a practice. This is the last week you're going to have that. The whole idea is that practicing creates perfect. If you want to get to Carnegie Hall, you practice, practice, practice. If I tell you to paint flowers this week and you can't get flowers, then do dog toys if you have a dog. If you don't have a dog, then do cat toys. If you can't do that, then look in your cupboard of, you know, where you have dishes and pull out dishes. And if you don't have dishes, then paint paper plates and styrofoam cups. Your inspiration could be found anywhere. And when we we're talking about burnout, I mean, what if you painted a milk carton with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Be playful and fun. Get out of your mood. Painting sandwiches all week would be fun than not. And then come in and say, I didn't do any work this week because I couldn't find any plants. I mean, that's defeating. The only reason I give you that homework assignment is so that you, you just paint. It doesn't matter what you paint. I just don't want you to wander through the house. Be thankful I didn't say toilet paper this week. <laughs> but still, that could be extraordinary too as a study. How many did you do this week? I just did two. Mm -hmm. Now, because I said I would do four, but that no, don't, 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 right don't apologize. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember, you chose to do two, and don't give an excuse. Because when you say, "Oh, I promise this," and "Oh, yeah, I'm bad," and all this stuff, it's like, don't do that. Okay. In my classes, you can never do any. What What hurts is if if you knew you were going to do it, you decided not to do it because you hate me, and so that would be bad. But outside of that, you doing anything is awesome. If you can get one, that's great. Two is awesome. If you got four, that would be extraordinary. And I'm really amazed at, um, I threw this out to my YouTube family out there, and how many pledges I got from people. In fact, I've got so many pledges that I'm thinking, how can I put this up on a website? I mean, how awesome would it be if, because I've got a few of the YouTube videos out there, and plus also all of my classes. How awesome would it be is if I, as because they'll keep on doing these pledges, if I put them up somewhere so that everybody can see across the world. Yeah, and they could be anonymous if they want. But how awesome it would say, I mean, how many of you would love to see that donut painting I talked about? I mean, she just, she blew, I was like, oh my God. It's like, it was just so beautiful. What were you going to say? I remember when you said that when you did your Power Create class, you had them do the same subject. Five times. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what I was doing, was the same subject. Mm -hmm. And I could tell the improvement just by the second one. Mm -hmm. Because like, kind of halfway... What would have happened if I had done five? Yeah, but, but halfway, halfway through the project, you go, I wish I had more light on this. Or I wish it were a different color. You know, and so then you make a correction there. And then you do another one and you go, okay, I've corrected that. What if I add this to it? And then you're three ways... You're three, uh, three paintings into it. So if we were talking about the edge, the edges, yeah. remember our edge conversation? Yeah. So where's your central focal point? The white, up here, yeah. Yeah, okay. So literally what we would do is we'd be thinking about, I don't know if you guys are getting a glare or not, but we'd be thinking about having your hard edges here. And since this is really your main focal point up here, mm -hmm. this is where you'd want to have your darkest dark too. And it doesn't matter if this is dark and that's gray. 
that uh, you can have the darkest dark in here. You just want to make sure that your lightest light is against something that's darker than that. Okay. And it's where the two contrasts come together the strongest. Even though this might not be as dark as that back there, but the contrast between the flower in the background and the background itself isn't as severe. So we're always looking for the strongest contrast of where the lightest light and a dark come together. And when you darken back there, that will pop that out. Okay. Boom, and we did that with your painting, Jan, today. Remember how we backlit that owl and it was like all of a sudden it came out? It was like really crucial. Um, so if the light's coming through here, again, you know, it's, you have this kind of cast shadow in here, which is really beautiful. Beautiful brush strokes all the way through, but look at all the hard edges in here. Now all of these hard edges in there are causing us to, to kind of wander around here. And if these were softer edges, and then as we get inside the flower, you eliminate the edges too. And so they kind of come from a soft edge to a hard edge to a soft edge. You can actually create that feeling of the, the bend of the flower. The stem in here probably should have been a little toned down because you want to make it feel like that flower comes out at us and you don't want that competing light against dark. Here we have light right against the dark. And so this line here is competing with that right there. So you may have to lighten the background there or darken the shadow and you probably darken the shadow more so that you don't get the contrast so strong. Um, hard edges, you know, here these, all these edges could have been soft. So when we're talking about soft edges though, yeah, we think we're just going to go in and soften just a little bit. But oftentimes, the bigger the smudge, the better. So actually dragging this stuff off really is awesome. And we you experience that again with the boat. Remember, we weren't just going around the edge. We just pulled that color off. And it's, it feels like light's hitting an object and bouncing off of it. Yes. Yeah. And it, it loosens the painting up a lot more. And people go, I want to paint loose paintings. You know, so then they paint a painting and then they soften all the edges and it's like, that's not that. But when you run into something like this, you have to be kind of bold, you know, and just kind of break, break those edges. The same thing here, look at that hard edge. Yes. You know, what would happen if we would blur that down? One way to conquer red, because red's really, really a pain in the ass to, to, to get right, right? Mm -hmm. One of the secrets I found, one of the secrets I found, when red, is, when red is a challenge, when red is just like, don't paint it red. Don't paint it red. Just avoid red altogether wherever you can. And how many of you are like looking at the coin, she's a genius. She's a genius. The key to it is don't try to be clever, just sit and paint. And so she wasn't trying to do anything. And so that fear of like, oh, I'm not going to be original, all this, uh, you know, that you just sat down and painted. It was all of a sudden, now you're just showing us how awesome you are as a painter. So and it, it was all right. It yeah. just shows up, yeah. yeah. So sometimes in the journey of, of trying to be clever, you show up as a master. Did you set this up on a blue tarp or something? Actually, no, I did not. Okay. You can tell. Right? Yeah. What kind of background did you have? It was, well, I just had my plant on my stand, and it was just, oh, well, there's a palm thing behind it and all. Yeah. But I wanted to So this it. painting fell apart before you started it. Oh, because of the background. If you're going to paint Ala Prima, you literally have to have the model there. Becky's painting turned out really awesome because she didn't try to do anything except paint what she saw, and she didn't change anything. She all of a sudden woke up and said, wow, there's something there that I could paint. And she just reiterate it. When you change the background, it changes all the colors. You run into a problem. One of the biggest mistakes that people do is that they'll paint a flower and then they'll think it's a good idea to paint the complementary color behind it. Don't do that. Because complementary colors irritate people. <laughs> I mean, painting a lemon on a purple background is a bad idea. Yeah. It's a good idea to really get in little kids. Look, purple and, and yellow. But whenever you put complementary yeah. colors together, they fight. And I, I mean, that, you learn that. Yeah. So when did you think it was a good idea to do that in a painting? It's like, ah, <laughs> piss me off. <laughs> Don't do that. When you put something in a space like this, there's so many things that, that the background does to the object itself. Yeah. If you've got that blue, it's going to reflect. And most people think, oh, I could kind of adjust the colors and make it up, because after all, I'm a great artist. But the reality is, 
No, don't do that. Paint what you see. Okay, so you need to set that up. I talk about painting what you see, but a lot of times when I paint, I just make things up. Now, I can do that because I understand lights and temperatures and stuff like that. So I had this large painting of a goat on the edge of a cliff. Okay, big white goat. And I had it there for a long time in my studio going, what's wrong with this painting? Finally, last night, after I did my campfire chat edge thing, I pulled it out and said, oh my god, look at all those edges. And so I started like rubbing the edges back out. I was like going, oh my god, I'm not even listening to my campfire chat. And after I got that through, I said, what's wrong with that goat? Why don't I like that goat? And I go, because I painted the goat white, silly, and white isn't really a color of a goat. Especially if they're in shadow and the light's coming from behind the goat, which would put the whole goat into shadow, which would be a dark color. They're not white. And so you did the same thing. That camellia, as it goes into shadow, gets dark. Right. And oftentimes it can get so dark that the background actually silhouettes on it. You wonder why Jan paints so well? Because she practices a lot. How many did you do? I did five. How many did you pledge? Five. Well, we were supposed to do one a day for five days. There you go. How did that feel? Made my hands hurt. <laughs> you did an awesome job because every painting was in itself a masterpiece. The yeah. disaster was day two. Day two. And it was late at night and went, well, that didn't work very well. Well, yeah, but the thing is, remember how I told you that all artists are imposters and they have a whole garage full of crap? Yeah, that's one of your garage paintings. Maybe two of these will be your garage paintings because you're going to do so many better. But it's not about the painting itself. It's about what you learn and you know, whether or not you learn. Red tulips for Valentine's Day. How many paintings did you do? I did six. Whoa! I think that in itself is a round of applause. One a day? They're, they're just studies. That's all I want was studies. It's about the learning process that's important. So her attitude is good. So it's really good, you know, after you flop, you just go, thank you, move on to the next thing. <laughs> You know, you've got so many paintings as it is, and so many really great paintings, that you could afford not having any for weeks, right? Just to play, get out of your rut, paint a big one, right? See, a focal point is something you determine, and that's why I always ask students, so what were you thinking? Um, you see this wonderful central focal point being light, but it's almost getting to be a little bit too much like a bullseye. We, what we always want to do is kind of create the feeling, and I notice this, as we're looking at some of them, some of them, it really becomes more about just that one thing. But we want to be able to go from here down to here. And I think if we had a little bit more of this beautiful blue highlighted color in there, in here, and then maybe something up here. So we just kind of get a little bit broader compositional flow to this. It, to be inspired, you have to generate it. It really comes from inside. And part of the generation, to generate something, to be inspired, again, this is kind of the burnout thing, is that you really have to look at every time you paint a painting as an opportunity. And looking at something like that, you just ask yourself, okay, I'm not really cared about this model. You guys paint paintings all the time that I go, I would never paint something like that. But I don't tell you that because then you would be like, it's like, okay, so I have to find something that I'm inspired by at that point. Otherwise, I'd be an awful teacher. And so I look at that and I go, how can I do that? And the best way to do that is to actually commit to myself, what well, makes it look like that? How can I take that and make that look real? Because that would be the ultimate inspiration. Can you actually pull that off? And in the process, just like with Becky, kind of uninspired, like, ugh. And then all of a sudden she starts working on it. And she goes, wow, I found a little inspiration here. I said, you don't find inspiration when you are, when you are thinking about it or, or when you, you're looking at the model. You have to, inspiration shows up when you show up. And if you're not inspired, start painting. They asked the Hammenstein, they said, how can you possibly write music like you do? Every day, on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And he says, well, you know, how do you get the inspiration for that? How do you find your muse for that? He says, I go into my, into my music room, and I sit at the piano, and I start making noise. Mm -hmm. And in that process, you start discovering something. If, if you don't show up, it's not going to show up. Inspiration comes if you show up. If not, it's not going to show up for you. In fact, the ancient Greeks used to say, how did you do today? They'd say, oh, my muse didn't show up. And they used to call it genius. Right? So they showed up. They sat there. They worked in marble. 
You can imagine if you, if you don't feel like it and you're cutting marble and you make a mistake. I mean, can, you can't glue that stuff on. It's gone. It's to have your muse there. So people will say, oh, I showed up, but my genius didn't. So you know when you work on small canvases, it's like you show up small. Really? If you guys want to do homework outstanding, then really play big. Do 16 by 20 homework assignments and use bigger brushes. There's a point where square footage matters, but when you're dealing with 12 by 16, 9 by 12, you can just increase the size of your brush and compensate for that. But you know, when you get to a, a 16 by 20, 20 by 4, there's not brushes big enough that do the same thing. But when you're working on small canvases, you've got to go to the small brushes, which, you know, like I said, if you start off small, you're going to end small. It just feels like you're just... <sighs> So paint big. If you're not inspired, get a bigger canvas. Fill it up. Trust that if you show up, your genius will too. And here again too, we even got smaller. When I thought, when I thought you couldn't get smaller, you went smaller yet. I seriously thought you had gone to as far as we could go. So if we were feeling small before, now you're really feeling puny. And you are a big, gorgeous painter. A big broad with lots of, look at, you've got, you shine, look at your earrings and your, your jewelry, get into that. Watch out with your brush strokes. Your brush strokes are following the contour of your outside edge. So counter your brush strokes, okay, so instead of following around that way, go across, especially in the area of your highlights. So go across and do your counter. But look at all this in here, all those hard edges in there. Every one of these is a contrast, and as we're looking at this, we're just like mulling all this over. So all this needs to go into softer edges. All this stuff needs to go into dark and bring up the front. This is a Mardi Gras mask. It's drama. Expanded instructional DVDs that feature an hour-long demonstration of today's painting and other paintings in the series are available at the Grandview by calling 1-800-511-1337. Join us on our website, thegrandview.org, and get more information about our show. There you can download our free book, Everything You Need to Know About Outdoor Painting, along with a free diagram of today's subject. It's funded in part by... PaintingFromNature.com a website for artists seeking inspiration, advice, and knowledge to master painting from nature. Paintingfromnature.com